panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here at this event. And uh, as uh, Desai Saab mentioned, that today is Gandhi Jayanti, but uh, today is also the birthday of uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri, uh, who not only gave us the slogan Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, but uh, who also did not take Pakistan's aggression in 1965 lying down. They attacked in Jammu and Kashmir, he sent the Indian Army into Lahore. So he was someone, he was someone who wouldn't turn the other cheek, right? So he would give as good as it gets. So it's appropriate that we are discussing Puri uh, in this context today. Now, uh, I want to talk about the strategic options post Puri and of course our uh, response post 2611. The, uh, uh, the unfinished agenda of 2611, the reforms that have not been carried out. Uh, you know, why, what is really important is that to understand our responses to Pakistan, generally Pakistan-sponsored terrorism, have been tactical. They've been, you know, knee-jerk reactions, right? It's very predictable, as our panelists have mentioned. But for the first time, the government has acted with, I mean, with almost like a strategic mindset. They have hit Pakistan in multiple ways. I mean, diplomatically, economically, uh, politically, and finally the military uh, action, which was a tactical action, but with strategic ramifications, like our panelists mentioned earlier, that we have signaled the end of our strategic restraint. This culture of 30 years of just lying down and taking it, you know, blow after blow in Kashmir or in Punjab or in the hinterland of India, that is over. Now, that has completely confused the Pakistanis. So this is what we are talking about, surgical strikes. So, uh, now, it's really important that we push this advantage through. Because, you know, in India, I have this feeling that everything is like cricket for us. That we say that the match is finished, let's go back to the pavilion. And it's going to be square, you know, all back to square one, all over again. It's really important that we have to push uh, we have to ensure that change comes out of this. Some good comes out of what has happened, what we have seen in the last couple of days. Uh, the multiple options that we have exercised against Pakistan. Uh, uh, very, very amazing, you know, concert of uh, options that the government has exercised. Like I mentioned earlier, political, diplomatic, economic, and finally the military aspect. Now, what are our primary objectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan? What is our prime concern vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan? I mean, what the government says is that dismantle the infrastructure of terrorism in Pakistan. And, uh, you know, to my mind, this is what uh, was put so succinctly by Hillary Clinton, the then uh, Secretary of uh, Foreign Affairs in the US, when she said in Islamabad, she goes and she says that no country can rear snakes in your backyard. If you rear snakes in your backyard, there's no telling when they'll turn around and bite you. She said that about five years back, and I think it's one of the most brilliant expositions of uh, what the world has been saying. But uh, now, you know, a lot of panelists have also mentioned this, uh, my, my previous speakers have said that how this entire power of a nuclear bomb comes. Every time there is a, a, a you know, a terrorist attack, I mean, there's a terrorist attack and immediately escalates, this noise, you know, escalates into a threat of nuclear war, and there's, you know, noises from across the border where you have the, Defense Minister of Pakistan saying, you know, bomb gira denge, khatam kar denge, all that. So where did this, you know, where do these two things come together? I mean, you think that terrorists are different from nuclear weapons, but uh, that's not how the Pakistan state sees it. For them, uh, and by the state I mean Pakistan army, the deep state that controls Pakistan. The deep state, the Pakistan army sees terrorists and nuclear weapons as strategic assets, right? And this begins in the 70s. I'll just take you back into history. It's the year 1977 when uh, President Bhutto is deposed by uh, General Zia, the third uh, dictator of Pakistan. And when he deposes him, he not only gets control, he not only gets political power, but he also gets control of the nuclear weapons of Pakistan, right? Which was a civilian program a civilian program which has been hijacked by the military and it continues to be held by the military. Now it's led to a very interesting situation there in Pakistan where Pakistan today is the only country in the world which, where the military controls nuclear weapons directly. I mean nowhere in the world, it's not the case in China and certainly not even in North Korea.
where the military directly controls nuclear weapons. It's the case in Pakistan, and it's exactly the opposite in India. Right? Until recently, I mean, our generals, I'm sure, wouldn't have even seen nuclear weapons. Right? And they were as surprised as the rest of the country in 98 when we kind of came out of the closet and exploded our bombs. But I'll come to that later. Uh, so in 77, after he takes over the nuclear weapons program, something else happens in the 70s. In 79, the Soviets come to Afghanistan, they invade Afghanistan, and suddenly Pakistan is transformed into the frontline state in the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. And this brings them, uh, with, this opens up a huge pipeline of funding and uh, uh, you know uh, arms supplies from the West. They are meant to defeat this. Soviets in Afghanistan go Vietnam there. They do that for eight years, and that's when, uh, uh, as uh, Jan Bakshi mentioned, that this is when what emboldens them: this war of a thousand cuts. That they realize that if the Soviets can be bled in Afghanistan, India can be bled in Kashmir, it can be bled in Punjab. And and this struck me actually about 15 years back when I'd gone to Afghanistan. The only time I've been there. After the fall of the Taliban, uh, there was a camp that we visited just outside of Kabul. It was a former uh, Afghan military training uh, center for the Afghan army, which had been taken over by the Taliban. The Taliban had given it to the lashkar e taiba and the sipahi Sahaba Pakistan. These are terrorist groups operating from Pakistan. And uh, this had been bombed by the Americans. They had you know, virtually smashed the camp. Now, I found a lot of literature there. It was all Urdu. And the walls. They had you know, stuff written in Urdu, so I got the translator to tell you what it was. And there were these slogans there on the wall which, which said, Mujahideen ki lalka. Right? It says that, Kal Rus bikhar kar dekha tha, ab India tute dekhenge, hum bar e jihad ke sholo mein, Amerika ko chalte dekhenge. I mean, this is Afghanistan so far away from India, you would think. And that, to my mind, was it just kind of linked all these things together, all three things, like it was <laughs> Russia first, then it was America, and now it was our turn, right? And they thought that they could do the same thing to us. And this is precisely what the Afghan war taught the Pakistan deep state, that we can do the same thing to India, <laughs> what we did to the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So they continued, they just redirected their forces, their entire Mujahideen, their arms supplies, their expertise into India, first in Punjab, they bleed us in uh, through the 80s, and then they switch forces and they go into Jammu and Kashmir. This happens uh, through the 90s, and this has continued ever since. And it comes to a point when the nuclear weapons become a shield for the sword of terrorism. So Pakistan has been using this thing of sword of uh, terrorists and the shield of nuclear weapons. So any time. We try to react. Now, we don't have terrorists, right? They do. They have non-state, so-called non-state actors, but they're actually all part of the state. It's, it's an open secret. I mean, the elite in Pakistan is called Sarkari Mujahideen, right? They're virtually like recruited like normal uh, military people. Now, every time we try to retaliate for a terrorist attack, like in 2611 or, uh, you know, after 1993, they say they threaten you with nuclear weapons. You know, we will, you know, straight away go nuclear. So that has been one of the things that they've tried to induce fear into uh, the Indian political leadership. And I say political leadership because Pakistan achieved deterrence when the first F-16 started flying with a nuclear bomb. Forget all the missiles. The minute they told our political leadership that an F-16 will fly with a nuclear bomb and drop it on one Indian city, that was it. I mean, generals like General Bakshi and General Patakar are not afraid of nuclear weapons. They're trained to fight, and uh, you know, uh, the strike force are trained to fight and move through nuclear fallouts. But the political leadership is the one that has to worry about the consequences. And they were the ones that were frightened by the Pakistan nuclear weapons program. Now, uh, so coming back to the sword and the shield, what we have discovered in the last couple of years, and especially in the last few days, is that the Pakistan army is essentially an army of just two tricks. It's one army with two tricks. They have nuclear weapons and they have terrorists. Now, it's our duty to hit them with 22 options, right? They have two options, we can hit them with 22 options, right? This is political, it's diplomatic. I mean, look at the, uh, the kind of boycott that they've experienced in the Saab thing. I mean, I'm sure the generals in uh, GH2 Rahul Pindi would have been saying, this is actually the Wami Girade. The kind of international isolation that they've uh, that faced over the last couple of days. And if you see the, 
the, uh, the, the, the wording of uh, the, uh, the regrets that the pre Afghan president has sent to Pakistan, but he literally says that, uh, you know, I'm fighting a fire in my house which is lit by you. So, I am the Supreme Commander, I can't visit the Sark Summit, I'm sorry. So it's as bad as that, that somebody who was so close to them until a few months back is now completely turned the opposite direction. Now, there are many other options. I just want to quickly discuss four or five of them, uh, which is basically this unfinished agenda of post-2611, the reforms that we uh, started with great earnest. And, uh, and not only 2611, after Kargil, there have been a lot of reforms that have been held up, a uh, uh, lot of committees were set up, a lot of recommendations were made, but unfortunately, none of these are seeing light of the day. Now, the first, uh, the first and the most important aspect of my mind is the fact that we lack a comprehensive national security doctrine. Now, every country in the world defines its national security objectives, which is basically it's a it's a roadmap, it's a it's a goal. It says that look, I I'm, I want to be here in 20 or 30 years. I define my challenges, and this is how I plan to get there. Unfortunately, in India, we have not managed to do this. You first have a national security strategy, then you have a national military strategy, which is made by the defense ministry, and then the individual armed forces they build their own war fighting doctrines out of that. Now, unfortunately, this is a top-down approach. Unfortunately, in our uh, situation, we have a bottom-up approach. We only have something called the RM's op directives, the Raksha Mantri's operational directives, where he tells the armed forces, be prepared for all these, you know, contingencies, and be prepared for two-front war, or, you know, such. But the, uh, the sad part of the RM's op directives is that it does not come out of any independent assessment. It is basically, Service headquarters just making up their own assessments, what their own threat levels, and setting it up to the defense minister. And he sits at it, he looks at it, and he, you know, initials it and pushes it. And that is what passes off for national security in India, which is really sad. It must change. We must have a national security doctrine. We must know where India hopes to be in the next 20 or 30 years. What are her goals? What are her objectives? And there's no point in uh, you know, there's no point in having uh, maps because I think. Maps are, uh, there, there's a saying which says that what use is a map if you don't know where you're going, right? So we don't know where we are going and therefore no map in the world is going to help us. So if we can start with getting our national security strategy in place, then everything else will flow from that. The military is the very furthest end of that. The military is the very furthest end of that. It is one of the tools. It's not the only tool. Through a proper comprehensive strategy, we get, we explore the entire, the full smack of Indian hard and soft power and how we can do get to where we want to be. Now, uh, the second important thing here is political military war gaming. This is basically nothing but the politicians, the security establishment, and the military sitting together and war gaming scenarios. Now, what happens, unfortunately, is that we are always taken by surprise. Whether it is Kargil, or it is 2611, or even the Uri attacks. The first time that probably people meet in a, is in a crisis, and there are no options. I know that because I was privy to certain discussions that took place after 2611, where there were two meetings that were called at the very highest level, the CCS, with the military chiefs. And they were fumbling for uh, responses in the first two or three days, and everybody was looking at everyone. They had not met, war game, nothing of that sort. And this was something that the Cargill Review Committee had recommended in 2001, 15 years back. And yet, every time there's a crisis, we are found wanting. I mean, why do you blame the politician? Because he doesn't know the kind of tools that he has at his command. You know, what the armed forces are capable of, what are their capabilities, how far can they go, you know, what uh, platforms the Navy has, what are the options before him, what he can exercise. I mean, this is something that must happen on a regular basis. We must not wait for crises to hit us before we sit and meet together. And, and Puri, of course, is, a, is an exception because I think they worked very quickly. They got a very, very swift response, a range of responses, as you can see. You have the entire security establishment, you have the army chief, you have the national security advisor. That was, that was a heartening change. This is something that needs to be institutionalized. You must have constant meetings with the political establishment and the security uh, establishment. 
they must sit and war game scenarios, what you do. So the next time there's something goes up, the balloon goes up, you, you're there, you're ready with your options, and you know what to do. Now, uh, one of the main recommendations of the Cargill Review Committee was the creation of a uh, <coughs> combined uh, Chief of Defense Staff, the CDS. Now, uh, this is uh, something that successive committees have also emphasized that you need to have integration of the services because it's not the army going to fight one battle, the air force fighting another and the navy fighting a third battle. It's wars of the future are essentially going to be very short and sharp and they will need all the resources, they will need all the armed forces to come together. It's been 15 years now, we're still waiting for a CDS. The uh, uh, Narayshandra committee has recommended another thing, another option which is a permanent chairman chiefs of staff, whatever you call it, you need to have a single point military advisor for the government to turn to in a crisis. Now this is again, it's been two years, we're still waiting for this permanent chairman to come to, uh, uh, you know, appoint this permanent chairman so that we can harmonize all the resources of the three militaries. And uh, there, is, there is a certain thought process in the government and it really comes to, you know, four and it, it surprises you at times because I remember in December 2015 there was a combined commanders conference where the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Modi made what is to my mind one of the, one of the most uh, sharpest speeches made to military commanders in recent years when he basically told them that full-scale wars are going to be rare and he says that the threat will be known but the enemy will be invisible and he actually asked the armed forces to prepare for the wars of the future right and this is where you have three commands that will really help you get and fight these wars of the future these are again stuck you have a special operations command which is uh, uh, you know which gets special forces of all the three services together you have a cyber command, which will basically, um, you know, combine your offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. Give another set of options to the government. For instance, if there's another terrorist attack like Uri, you won't have to properly, uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily go in and strike him uh, through commando raid. It could be a massive cyber attack which paralyzes all his uh, internet facilities or, you know, shuts down his uh, the oil, uh, you know, uh, drilling industry, gas fields, for instance. It could be a range of options, so commands like this, and of course the third command is the space command. Options like the, uh, the uh, commands, joint commands like these, futuristic commands like these would give our policy makers, our decision makers, many more options to tackle uh, Pakistan or any other country or any other security uh, uh, emergency in case they arise. And these have been pending for very long and uh, I just hope these get done very quickly. The uh, I want to come to military modernization. Now, uh, this is another aspect that's been uh, we've been found wanting in for the last 15 years. Post Kargil, we started this process of re-equipping our, our armed forces. You, you're all aware of the fact that until 1999, we had absolutely no ammunition. They were virtually, you know, again running to South Africa and Israel, getting out, getting out uh, ammunition from their stocks. We were at an all-time low, and which is one of the reasons that Pakistan chose to attack, because they thought that we could not give them a conventional military response. Now, since 1999, our military modernization has come to a complete halt. The Air Force doesn't have fighter planes. The Navy doesn't have submarines or helicopters. The Army, which is actually fighting the battle day in and day out, the people there are on the ground, is facing a critical shortage of bulletproof jackets, helmets, assault rifles, you have the numbers there, the numbers are staggering. There's a shortfall of 1.85 lakh assault rifles, there's 1.4 lakh helmets that they need, 3.6 lakh bulletproof jackets. All these requirements have been pending since 2009, right? So you're just reminded of that saying that a magazine gave 20 or 30 years back about the Indian soldier when they went into China. Uh, sorry, went, went to the border war with China, under-equipped, ill-equipped, poorly, uh, uh, you know, uh, kitted out, where they said that the Indian soldier lacks everything but courage. And sadly, this is still the case. This continues. These requirements have been pending for so long. For someone like the infantry soldier who is the cutting edge of your response against something like, say, terrorism, which you're fighting on a daily, uh, 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 you know, you're fighting it 
day in and day out. You have these kind of crippling requirements, uh, shortfalls that have not been met. I mean, this is this is uh, appalling to say the least. I mean, there's no army in the world that equips its soldiers as poorly as we do. Now, uh, I went to the line of control the first time was in 1996, and the last time was in uh, last year. In these 20 years, the only change I've seen in the Indian soldier is the fact that uh, he has a mobile phone, which he didn't have in 1996, which he's bought from his own uh, pocket. So it's, it's really sad because he's got the same bulletproof jacket, the same old one, the heavy one. He's wearing the same patka. He's got the same AK-47. He's got the same boots. And uh, you know, it's really, it's, it's just so true that he lacks everything but courage when he's standing there, you know, guarding your frontiers. And this is something that you need to fix on a, on, a, on a war footing, if I may use the word. And finally, I want to come to this thing of internal security, which is this thing of bolstering our uh, counter-terrorist infrastructure. And that, that kind of fits into this thing of police modernization. These are two very, very critical shortfalls that we have not met in the last many, many years. Successive states have sat on it, successive governments have, you know, uh, been very slow, very lax. After 2611, you had these three wonderful institutions that are supposed to have been set up. One is the Crime and uh, Criminal Tracking Network System, the National Counterterrorism uh, Center, and the NatGrid. These were supposed to be the future response against terrorism that you know you would have seamless connectivity all over. You know, anytime there's a terrorist attack, anywhere, any terrorist crosses here, there's a record, it can be instantly accessed there. You know, it was like a 21st century kind of thing after 2611. It's been what, eight years since 2611? And all of these are stuck like that Toto is there, you know, in the graphic. They're all stuck. Our entire counter-terrorism grid is stuck. The NSG, as you might have discovered in, in the Patan Court thing, was once again it's been exposed. I mean, they, the, the flaws of the NSG, you <laughs> first saw it in 2611. You've, they've repeated that thing in Patan Court again. The very nature of that force has not changed. It's your primary counterterrorism force. It's the one that will be your first responder against terrorism, any terrorist attacks or hostage situations. They continue to be ill-equipped. They're not a permanent force. Which means that you know you have people coming there for uh, you have soldiers and officers coming there for two or three year deputations, which act absolutely make no sense whatsoever. You cannot have you cannot build a permanent character for an organization like the NSG, which is so critical. I mean, if you call it your primary counterterrorism force, then you have to equip it. And and of course, there is an aspect of police reforms. And let, let's not forget that the policeman on the ground is your first responder against terrorism and he continues to be ill-equipped. We don't, we don't have basic things like you know, dividing uh, uh, you know, a, a normal police work from investigations. The policeman is supposed to do everything. In the morning he'll be doing Nakabandi, in the afternoon he'll be investigating the crime scene, the, at night he'll be doing uh, you know, another set of duties. So we've just burdened our police force beyond uh, imaginable limits. And the reason when they fail is that the armies has to be brought in. When the police and the paramilitary fail, the Indian army is brought in. They're tied down in internal security situations, which is not their primary task and which is what they are uh, caught up in, in whether it be Kashmir or in the Northeast. So I, uh, these are some of those responses that I think that if we address on war footing, these are the five things. There has never been a better time than this that you have a government that is for the first time proactive, which is actually struck across the line of control, and hopefully they will move on these other pending reforms as well and give us a befitting, uh, give terrorism a befitting response. Thank you.